Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Laurie Fazzano. Fazzino. Fazzino? Yeah. Fazzino, okay. Uh, who is a doctoral student in sociology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who I believe wins the prize for, oh, well, mission to being the affiliate of the year, uh, for also bringing the most people here, 17 people from their group, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's actually, uh, she's raised Catholic and then uh, found evangelical Christianity and helped found a church. Uh, so, you know, got that one done. Uh, and uh, eventually, um, and I would love to hear the full story about this sometime, got kicked out yep. for evangelical church. Uh, I have a funny feeling that thinking about things too hard may have been involved. Well, isn't a very good Christian. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so she brings that experience, and then um, now her doctoral research is on how people go from being believers to non-believers. Mm -hmm. So, um, please help me in welcoming Lori to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, August, for that great introduction. Can you guys see me? <laughs> Can I move this down maybe a little bit? Yeah, all right. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to thank the SSA for bringing me out. I think we spoke, I can speak for most researchers when I say, you know, we really hope that the work we do really affects, you know, our own disciplines. But more than that, we really hope that the work we do can impact the communities that we study in some small way. So with that, um, I really hope that Whatever I say today, you know, you guys can take away, and I hope it impacts you in just some small way. The aims of my talk today, I'm going to be sharing um, several experiences of apostasy. You know, and these experiences are often potentially stigmatizing, often potentially rejecting, and oftentimes can be very lonely. And I also want to address our crucial role in easing that transition from religion to irreligion, you know, making it easier to go from a religious identity to one that's, you know, a non-believing identity, and thereby creating a satisfying and happy secular experience. I want to briefly um, start by talking about my personal experience a little bit. I was raised Catholic um, in New York. There's four generations of Catholic women in my family. When I was 16, um, I moved to Washington State where I found evangelical Christianity. Um, cat the cat Catholicism just wasn't doing it for me, you know. There had to be something more than sit, stand, kneel, and recite prayers from a book. Um, I went to a nerd ball when I was 16, a New Year's Eve event, and I got saved. Um, I accepted Jesus into my heart. I uh, eventually got involved with a megachurch, Christian Faith Center. You know, lots of loud rock music and cool things like that. And halfway through the middle of an internship that I did there, um, the youth pastor felt the call to start um, to start his, his own church, and I helped found Real Life Church. But as you can see in that one picture, I kind of had some interesting things go on while I was in the church. I wasn't really a very good Christian, which is probably why I ended up deconverting. Um, that was a youth, uh, a youth conference that I was at, and uh, I was in charge of the new visitor table, and I was goth. So, yeah. But the one thing that I could say about being in the church is that it was all about community, which is why I stayed for so long. You know, I found friends there, we, you know, we went out, we did things, and I felt, I felt accepted. And that was super important. But, like I said, I wasn't a very good Christian, so eventually I ended up backsliding. Sadly, though, I didn't find much in the way of, a, of my backslidden life. I didn't find much in the way of a non-believing um, lifestyle. And so, like the prodigal son, I went back. Um, and in 2006, I ended up uh, being kicked out of church for different lifestyle choices and questioning things too much. And I just stopped going altogether. Now, I do want to share a couple of narratives from participants of my research that I, did, I just completed for my master's. Um, and these narratives, I hope, will touch you in the way that they've touched me. They've impacted my research, uh, but more than that, they've had an impact, uh, a profound impact on who I am as a person and the way that I think about things. The first person I want to talk about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. First, let me just talk about um, deconversion and why people deconvert. There is a bunch of literature that talks about why people deconvert, right? This is not something that is, you know, misunderstood. People leave because, you know, there's cognitive uh, inconsistencies, like things like, um, you know, my pastor said that uh, the world was only 10,000 years old, but um, science says it's 4.6 billion years old. What do I believe? You know, people leave because of social experiences, you know, experiencing things like hypocrisy, which was huge in my life. And both of those experiences contribute to these negative emotional experiences. So, you know, uh, things that will create this kind of internal conflict. And, and, you know, 
people then go on a, a journey to seek to try and resolve that conflict. Now I'll get to my participants. And the first person I want to talk about is Adam. Um, Adam was an evangelical Christian who um, self-described uh, self uh, as an on-fire Christian um, and wanted to be a pastor. Now the thing with deconversion is a lot of the literature says that the process of deconversion is really is gradual. Right? And that's true. Um, those experiences that I was, I was just talking about, um, they're oftentimes experienced for years before people come to finally decide, no, this is it and I, and I want to be out. But the moments of deconversion are often instantaneous. And what I want to share with you are three moments of, of is instantaneous deconversion. So I'd just like to read some quotes from my participants. Adam and I'll set this up. Um, Adam and his wife and her and her family were on a trip to Mexico, where every every day a man, a male, led a Bible study, and Adam led it on the last day. But prior to going to the trip, he picked up the book, The God Delusion, and he wants to read it on the plane. You know, goes through the trip, goes you know goes down there on the plane. You know, goes his whole way through the trip, doesn't read it, starts to read it on the way back, and this is what he says. He says, "So on the plane ride home from Mexico, I was reading. I had a moment where I was reading through one of the arguments that he made in the book." And as I'm reading through, I was like, okay, I accept your premise. Okay, go. I follow step by step with the arguments, and it gets to the end, and it was a correct argument. I accept the premise, I accept the arguments, and I have no choice but to accept the conclusion. And I am like, fuck. <laughs> His words. Um, because I didn't expect that, and I didn't know what that meant. My wife is sitting uh, next to me with her head on my shoulder asleep, and 18 hours ago I was leading a Bible study, and now I just read that this thing, this thing that says God doesn't exist, and I believe it. The next narrative I want to share with you comes from um, a, young, a young woman named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was, uh, grew up in a household where her parents, uh, at one time or another, uh, one or both of them were in the ministry. She was actually taught to recite catechism from the time she was three. Can you even imagine? Okay. Now Elizabeth really tried, like she wanted to believe, and this is what we're going to see. Uh, she said, it literally was one day I identified as Christian and the next day I didn't. Christian one day and not the next. I just felt like I wanted so much to believe. I really did. Really wanted to believe. Whether it was to make my parents happy or because I thought it was the right thing, I wanted desperately to believe. Now what we can see from Adam and Elizabeth's narratives are the moments of deconversion are often instantaneous, like I said, but dramatic and traumatic. Okay, Elizabeth didn't come to this easily. And this is something that she really, really, really wrestled with for a lot of years. The last narrative I want to share is from my participant. His name's Barkley. Barkley is awesome, just want to say. And I'm not just saying that because he's in this room. Um, he found comfort in, in, in family in church. He was often um, compared to his superstar brother. And unfairly, because Barclay was a superstar in his own right, both academically and musically, um, having participated in an ensemble in high school that actually won a Grammy, you know? But for whatever reason, that just wasn't enough, and his brother always took center stage. Well, in church, he found that he could just be. He could just be himself, no comparison. And, but there was hypocrisy in the church, because God loves everybody, and we're going to feed the homeless, um, but we hate gay people, you know? And so he actually went to a school um, that had a really large uh, gay pride alliance, and his plan was to become president of this so he could shut it down. Um, that didn't happen. Um, at the end of his freshman year, Barclay's, uh, Barclay's friend came out as, his best friend came out as being gay, and he didn't know what to do. And so he went on a quest to try and reconcile what was going on. The conclusion he came to is, he says, I always saw the Christian community as hypocritical, preaching morals, expounding their virtuous lifestyles while living in the squalor, filth, and self-deprivation. It started weighing on me of what is it to be moral? Who decides morality? And then I actually went back to read the Bible cover to cover. cover. I was appalled at most of the moral teaching. This is clearly no way to live a moral lifestyle. That's pretty consistent with a lot of the literature on deconversion um, that says people that actually will sit down and read the Bible cover to cover instead of cherry picking um, actually deconvert because it's a horrible text. And I think we can probably all agree about that. Um, but these participants, more than anything, had a lot to lose. Um, Adam eventually lost his wife. He came out four days later and he told her, hey, look, you know, I'm an atheist. And um, he didn't want, like she was evangelical, he didn't want to divorce her. And she left the house without a word and came back and said, I want a divorce. And they kind of talked about it for like two months and, you know, inevitably he lost his wife. 
he lost his business. Elizabeth ended up losing her family and having to relocate 2,000 miles away from her hometown. And Barclay left, lost all the acceptance that he had in church. So the most common experience of deconversion is that defectors have little resources and very few allies. And we're going to get to why groups like SSA is so important. And this, it has a lot to do with this. Now, right after deconversion, uh, participants had to kick in to what I call paradigmatic work, right? They had to start to reconstruct their identities in such a way that was independent of religion. All right, so that's the cognitive, social, and emotional work that, you know, allows them to construct um, a whole new different worldview. So they did cognitive work, right? The epistemological restructuring and biographical reconstruction. They did social work, you know, so severing those incompatible social ties and finding new ones. And they did emotional work. So that was a deliberate shift, really, in one's emotional disposition. Like, I'm not going to be a suffering Christian. Like, I'm going to be a happy atheist. What the remainder of my talk is going to really focus on today is, um, is the social work. It's that severing of incompatible ties. And now I know I said that participants had a lot to lose, but when you leave religion, there's also a lot to gain, right? So this new understanding of morals and values, right? So that's completely independent of religion. You know, now embracing a self-driven purpose, right? So it's no longer about, um, well, what does God want for me? It's, well, what do I want for me? You know, finally, there are existential answers, right? So it's like, what happens when we die? Well, nothing. Duh. <laughs> All right? More autonomy and choice on who to, who to deal with and, and how to spend one's time. Right? It's not just about, it's no longer about, um, you know, I, I have to associate only with Christians because everybody else is going to pull me down. It's, no, I can choose to, you know, associate who, with who I want to associate. And there's also an increase in tolerance and respect. But... And I pose, is this enough to compensate for what's lost? 10 to 15 years ago, research will tell us that coming out, the process of deconversion, was a horrible experience, isolating, lonely, and that religious adherents were statistically significantly more happier, or happier than apostates. Okay, so, no, I say that this is not enough to compensate for what's lost. 15 years ago, Deconverts had this. Today, deconverts have this. But what is present today that wasn't necessarily present uh, 15 years ago? And that's what's needed. The social work, the social aspect of this. So again, let me remind you, it's that severing of incompatible ties. Right? Sometimes that has to be an active process. Sometimes you need to make a decision when you're coming out of religion, I am no longer going to associate with you. If every time I call you mom, you're going to be putting me down for my, for my new beliefs or the fact that I reject your beliefs, then that's it. I'm not going to talk with you. Okay? Sometimes they just, they just cut that for you. All right? Dealing with these assigned negative labels, such as defector, backslider, heathen, and immoral and dealing with the stigmatization, stigmatization and marginalization, right? And forming more congruent associations, virtual communities, atheist boards, meetup.com, physical communities such as the SSA, the campus, campus affiliates, where you have t uh, service opportunities, where you have opportunities for social gathering, where you have opportunities to, to get in line with people who have your thinking, right? That validate your reasons for deconverting. And that became very important for participants like Adam and Elizabeth and Barclay. Adam says, my friend circle became a non-theist friend circle, and that was important to me. Elizabeth said, what really helped was that I moved across country. My immediate going from Christianity was going to a group of atheists. So having those groups to be able to move into really helped that process. All right? Because there was acceptance, there was freedom, there was love, there was hope, and there was grace, a word that we often he associate with Christian communities, but it doesn't have to be, okay? People were able to find love in these, grace, like I said, hope, friendship, most important, acceptance. And I would also say validation. So I'm here to tell you today that there's a hopeful future for our community. I'll say that once again. There is a hopeful future for our community, and it begins with you. The empirical findings of my research would suggest that while overall deconversion is a net positive, 
um, the initial transition required a much higher cost than expected return, right? So leaving, it wasn't about, you know, well, is it going to benefit me to leave? You know, it was, wow, this is really going to suck. I'm going to lose a lot of my friends. I'm going to lose the acceptance I found. But I have to do what's right. I have to do what's right for me. And the key factor, the key factor for deconversion being a happy experience is that immediate access to a supportive non-religious uh, social circle. What I'm here to tell you, and don't throw rocks at me, okay? <laughs> In academia, we often talk about um, America being a spiritual marketplace, right? There's so many different denominations. It's like going to the mall and having so many different store, you know, choices for stores to shop at. What's well, the same thing? We've got so many different denominations that one, you know, can participate in. But what's amazing is that non-belief, atheism, agnosticism, you know, being spiritual but not religious, you know, being a spiritual nun, um, it has emerged as a viable and available product in this spiritual marketplace. And that's a really great thing because when you're leaving a denomination, you can go to non-belief because it's there. And it's there because of us. And it's there because of you. And it's there because of groups like SSA. So again, there is a hopeful future for our community. It's the visibility and the availability of groups. All of these groups that are popping up on, on the screen um, are crucial. They're crucial for creating, uh, for contributing to a happy, liberating, satisfying, irreligious experience. And I think I can speak for all of us in here when I say that's what we want. I want to finish the stories and kind of let you know where those participants are today. I collected this data um, about a year ago. Elizabeth. Um, she says, this is a fantastic quote, it's one of my favorites. She says, I told my mom a while ago that the best analogy I could come up with is that I felt like I was born to run marathons. I felt like I was born to run like the wind and every time I would start running, somebody would bash me in the kneecaps and I would heal and get back up again and somebody would bash me in the kneecaps again. And that somebody was religion, <laughs> right? And finally I got rid of religion and now I can run. I can run free and unimpeded. I'm happy because I'm living the way I was born. It's my pleasure with the, um, with the okay of my participants um, that I'll let you know that you might have heard that um, SSA UNLV was honored by um, the Affiliate of the Year Award. And it's my, it's my privilege to tell you that Elizabeth is actually uh, the current president of our SSA. Barclay says, I couldn't have chosen a better path because it literally set me down a path where I'm no longer compared to anyone. I found something I can greatly excel at. It's a home in and of itself, and it sort of inspired a worth of life in the end. You have a very, very finite time, and you have to enjoy every fucking second of it. Otherwise, what the hell are we here for? It's my pleasure and privilege. Barclay, do you want to wave? You don't have to. <laughs> it's okay, he's not waving. It's, uh, <laughs> it's my pre uh, pleasure and privilege to tell you that Barclay was actually one of the founding vice presidents of SSA at UNLV um, once we restructured. And so he really got involved um, because this was something that was so close to his heart and something that was so needed. And needed not only in Las Vegas, but needed nationally. Lastly, I want to end with Adam, that on-fire Christian, who I don't think I mentioned this earlier. Um, he actually used to work when he was 16 years old to send his friends to Bible camp. I don't know what you were doing when you were 16 and working with your money, but I was not sending my friends to Bible camp. Of course, I was evangelical at that time, so maybe I was going to Bible camp. But this is actually my favorite quote of all the data I collected over 20 people. And he said, I feel like I won the cosmic lottery just by being here. And it doesn't mean I can't get upset when things go wrong. It doesn't mean that I can't get hurt when people do things that violate trust or just disappoint me. I am so fortunate that I have anything at all. I just feel so fortunate that I am here and that I have any level of happy relationships and meaning in life. And that's amazing to me. It's a depth of new experience that I just, I wasn't aware of that was there when I believed in God. If any of you have talked to him for five minutes or listened to his presentation this morning, I am talking about Drew Pruitt, who um, was former president and public events officer at the SSA at UNLV. Um, yeah, so you can go harass him about being that on fire evangelical Christian. But Adam is Drew, and 
the three of these participants did so much work because a group like SSA exists, because we exist on the national level, and we were able to take that, those visions, those goals, and run with them on the local level. And having that really gave them a home. Did ease that deconversion process. I want to thank you for your time. If you have any questions or comments, you know, you can come talk to me. Do we have time for questions? Oh, one question. One question. Um, and I just want to say, too, if you would like to be part of my larger dissertation work, which is actually looking at atheism as a social movement, um, please email me, friend me on Facebook, or I have business cards. So thank you so much. in the air gets it. Anybody? What's your secular definition of grace? I'm sorry, what's my what? <laughs> you said you, that grace is a word that secular don't use, but what's your secular definition of grace? I think it's, it's right in line with just acceptance. It's, you know, we're all human, and I think what I've heard time and time again is, again, that, that we have increased tolerance and increased respect, and I think it's just treating people in a way that, you know, I mean, when, you, when you're a Christian, and this, I can attest to this from my own personal experience, you do like one thing wrong and they just want to kick you out. You know what I mean? And that's not having grace. All right, grace is about having respect. It's about having tolerance. It's about understanding that, you know what? We're just all human trying to figure it out. And I'm not gonna like kick you out of our group because our views don't align. Thank you.